Allen continues the development and enlargement of God's eternal purpose and plan in chapter 5. As the door became closed to the immediate access to the tree of life, God's wisdom and divine perseverance emerge with resilient beauty in undeterred planning, preordained before the foundation of the earth. Our holy creator was not caught off guard by Eden's outcome, but ready to implement the long-term strategy which ultimately guarantees God's economy in the earth. Chapter 5. Expulsion and Rediscovery Detoured Genesis 3, 22. B. And now, lest he put forth his hand, and take also of the tree of life, and eat, and live forever. This fragment of the mosaic reveals how Adam and Eve never fully realized their significance as a God-shaped vessel, but abruptly aborted the ultimate plan to come forward to the tree of life and eat. From this fragment of truth, we know that the central experience of the biosphere was missed due to the fall. Adam and Eve's purpose as a vessel in God's image and likeness had been cut short because their exclusive design was centered upon their capacity to be indwelt by God. They were detoured prior to gaining God in His indwelling presence, and the cargo of sin preempted entrance into the first earthen vessels. Adam and Eve could hear the voice of God and were aware of God's presence. Nevertheless, being conscious of God's manifest proximity still fell short of God's goal for them. This external presence is characteristic of an old agreement or old covenant relationship and is not capable of attaining the fulfillment of the prime directive of God's plan. The old covenant relationship foreshadowed the coming of a better plan and was a preparatory model to achieving God's goal in the creation of humanity. Adam and Eve's capacity as living containers was experienced and realized, but only in its negative potential, for a new element had gotten on board these earthen vessels. Illicit Cargo Experience Genesis 3, 7 And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. As living containers, Adam and Eve became exploited through an illicit cargo experience, and the vulnerability of having their eyes opened brought about a strange new sense of nakedness. This eye-opening experience was a counterfeit of the genuine article, and quickly ushered Adam and Eve into a sense of nakedness and forfeiture. They were stripped and disrobed of the sense of purpose and destiny that had overshadowed them since their creation. The sense of nakedness caused them to sew fig leaves together to make a covering, because the introduction of the illicit contents caused a deep sense of defection concerning God's plan. The sewing of aprons was an attempt to alleviate the sense of nakedness, because their nakedness was realized in contrast with their previous sense of purpose. Their apron sewing impulse has been passed down to each of us, and from a young age, we overlay our consciousness with apron after apron of distracting activity. We surround our consciousness with as much distracting activity as possible to insulate ourselves against the awareness of a purpose default. Genesis 3, 8 Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. The exposure of these uniquely designed vessels to a misguided use caused not only an attempt to avoid the inventor and creator, but also the beginning of a cover-up. The devious blanket of deception perpetrated by Satan was directed at obscuring the original aim of God's plan for these divinely shaped vessels. We can trace this sense of shame and the attempt to overlay our lives with items of secondary importance right up through today. The paranoid distancing of ourselves from the very one who created these divine containers is evident all around us. The subject of God is usually taboo in public and causes a negative reaction. This negative response is a repeat of the distortion caused by the shame of being deceived and blinded concerning God's plan. Mask of Shame Genesis 3, 23 and 24, a. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man. When God drove out the man from the garden, it began the step-by-step long-term version of accomplishing God's plan. We have seen how Adam and Eve covered themselves with a self-invented solution to deal with their sense of shame about departing from the designated path. This mask of shame was impossible to shake due to the permanence of the cargo of sin that had been ingested. If the cause of their shame remained intact, the negative symptoms would surely continue, 
and their problem involved more than a one-time mistake. Within them, something had drastically and permanently changed, for they had acquired a replicating nature that would become a source of habitual impropriety. Now their creator must deal with the issue of transgression in the beloved creation and solve their unrighteous nature, which had been acquired through a fatal choice. Adam and Eve's need, on the negative side, required God to provide a covering for sins and a terminating ingredient whereby the sin nature might be immobilized and abolished. 1 John 3, 8 and 9, Romans 7, 17 through 21. This twofold work on the negative side was indispensable to restoring humans to a condition suitable for God to achieve the original plan. Romans 5, 12. By one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. 1 John 3, 8. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. From these and other New Testament verses, we see that the illicit contents obtained in the primordial biosphere are passed from generation to generation. This unbroken chain of transmutation in humankind results from the bad payload passed from Adam and Eve to their descendants, and eventually to us. As we gaze at the outer edges of the Mosaic template, we see the personality of this element emerge that the scriptures refer to as sin. Genesis 4, 7b. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. This was part of God's warning to Cain concerning the type of offerings that he was presenting to God. The word lieth literally means crouch and implies an entity or presence. Over the years, Bible scholars have used this verse to show how sin is a real element with personality. With advancements in technology, medicine, science, etc., humans are still no closer to eliminating the sin nature that has incessantly haunted us ever since we emerged from the Garden of Eden. We still cannot escape the inevitable bearing of corrupt fruit. Topical Rub Romans 1, 29-31 Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. Here we see the personality of this embedded guest in its many infamous characteristics. These diverse expressions of the replicating cargo are intertwined with humanity's fragile morality and ethical behaviors. The symbiotic relationship between good and evil is guaranteed, whether we are rich or poor, famous or obscure. Despite all the self-help programs and therapy sessions, plus each person's brand of religion, we still see the blossoming forth of the very things mentioned above. This increases the need for each one of us to discover a fresh new way that can personally transform our human experience. All the solutions of men are like a person diagnosed with skin rash and treated repeatedly with a topical rub, although this person has pneumonia. The habitual misdiagnosis of the illness will lead to death and only the proper analysis can pinpoint the right cure. The ingestion of an antibiotic is the only thing that could bring about a real cure, and procrastination would worsen the debilitation. We humans are decaying from a misdiagnosis of our disease, which was contracted long ago in an experimental garden. Although this chronic sickness began in biblical times, yet the cure is close, and the spiritual antibiotic comes in an effective dose that only the apothecary of the heavenly physician can provide. Self-inflicted quarantine. Genesis 3, 8b. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. When Adam and Eve tasted the fruit, a mutation began, which caused their self-inflicted quarantine. They hid themselves amongst the very trees that God had given them for food. The nagging awareness of a change in the very fabric of their living vessels was the beginning of a life shrouded under the cloak of fear. This change in consciousness became a type of blinding filament and covering veil over their perspectives and feelings. In 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, we see that this change has blinded the minds of them that believe not. The isolating barrier of a falsely colored consciousness now tainted the previously clear view of God's voice and God's presence to these predecessors of us all. 
Adam and Eve's disintegrating perception of their ultimate purpose caused them to hide from God. As naturally as breathing, we now instinctively distance ourselves from everything that sounds like God. Much like wearing a pair of sunglasses throughout the course of a day, we are hardly able to discern the slow waning of the sun and the gradual darkening of our vision can only be seen when the sunglasses are removed. What a predicament! Although we are God-shaped, we are full of aversion to the very source, purpose, and meaning of our being. Symbiotic Existence We have a psychological contour that is like God's. In other words, we can exhibit such things as love, joy, patience, kindness, etc., and this full range of expression can be shown without the indwelling presence of God. We are a silhouette of divinity through having been created in the image and likeness of God. Though humankind is now fallen, we remain fully capable of showing things such as emotion, choice, and thought, and we are naturally endowed with the rough outline of God's shape, that became blended with the complex mixture of the forbidden tree's nature. The behavior that we now exhibit is colored by the contents that we carry, and our internal contents are the source of the behavior that we exhibit. Our God-given shape is now merged with the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil through the descent of the replicating sin element. However, although the genetic code of this element is passed without break from generation to generation, the outline silhouette shape of God is still evident within humans. So often the good aspect of the tree of knowledge of good and evil is mistaken for God, and we protect this fatal tree and prize it as a divine thing. We are now proficient at being a caricaturist of the virtues of God and are expert at showing a silhouette of the divine character. This shadow expression of God's virtues, although admirable on the surface, is far short of the divine standard. This erroneous simulation of God's virtue is inevitably mixed with the good and evil of that toxic tree. Both good and evil have a symbiotic existence in this source, and this combined nature of good and evil is what the scripture calls the flesh. This terminology is based upon the inseparable link between the corrupted nature and our natural constitution. To arrive at the genuine expression of God, requires a discernment of the difference between the natural expression and the exhibition of divine virtue that results from a vital union with the tree of life. We must differentiate between the natural-born expression of goodness and the spirit-born expression of godliness. Caricature Virtue John 21, 15-17 Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, Thou knowest that I love thee, he saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Here we see the contrast between caricature virtue and the expression of unfeigned divine virtue. On the surface, this conversation between Yeshua and Simon Peter seems redundant, but only in the English versions of the Bible. In the original Greek version, the use of the word love is far more specific. For there are three distinct Greek words, each of which has been translated as love at various times in English. Each time Yeshua used the word love to Simon Peter, he used the word agapau, which refers to the highest love or divine love. Simon Peter's response to the Lord's question all three times involved the use of the word filio, also translated as love. From the word filio, we get the word Philadelphia, which means brotherly love. The King James Version, as well as other English versions, uses the word love without the clear distinctions shown in the original Greek language version. In the original language of the New Testament, we can see that Simon Peter's love for Yeshua came from Peter's natural origin. Yeshua continued calling him Simon, rather than his new name Peter, suggesting his disciples' reliance on his old nature. Also, the repeated reference to Peter being the son of Jonas indicates his tie to the natural order. John 3, 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, 
and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. These words, spoken by Messiah Yeshua to an influential Jew, Nicodemus, reveal that the natural birth cannot be the progenitor of the spiritual birth. If we have not eaten from the tree of life, we have one source from which we may express ourselves, and this natural birth cannot originate anything other than its own resource of expression. If we have experienced the spirit birth that results from coming to the tree of life to eat, we now have two sources from which to draw upon and live. Whichever source we rely upon brings forth the fruit that reflects its origin. Orientation of Consciousness, Romans 3, 23 For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The entrance of sin frustrated our potential for intimacy with God, as well as our ability to express and demonstrate God's attributes because the authentic exhibition of these virtues is based upon God's indwelling presence. The Garden Default preempted this experience and created a heritage of an aborted proposition regarding the human glorification of God. This is the legacy of an ill-fated cargo passed from generation to generation. Genesis 3, 7a and the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. Adam and Eve certainly had natural vision prior to the fall, so this verse refers to their inward sight. Their inner perception was open to see that which had previously remained invisible to them, and this became an eye-opening experience for them both. Their understanding had now been opened, but to what? The phrase, they knew that they were naked, gives a hint concerning the new awareness of Adam and Eve. This fragment of truth reveals a change in the orientation of their consciousness, for now their awareness was turned toward self, producing the sense of nakedness. They were originally oriented toward God consciousness rather than self consciousness. Now a change had occurred that caused their awareness to gravitate to the self instead of God. Prior to the fall, their soul based awareness leaned toward their human spirit. Immediately following the entrance of sin, their human spirit was deadened, and the clear transparency of spiritual sight was quenched, which became the first symptom of that which the Creator had forewarned. Complete Antithesis Genesis 2, 17b For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. The mysterious death element had already begun to show its impact on the most critical area of Adam and Eve's makeup. The couple was still alive and lived long after their expulsion from Eden. Nevertheless, their consciousness had changed, and their constitution had become altered from its original state. The death that entered them was the complete antithesis of their Creator's attributes, because the primary characteristic of their Creator was life as shown forth in the Tree of Life. In contrast to God as life, the other tree conveyed death into their being, and became an injection of death comparable to a poisonous creature, inserting its stinger into a victim, and thereby dispersing its replicating neurotoxin from cell to cell. 1 Corinthians 15, 56 describes this as the sting of death, and attributes its point of origin to sin. This sting had its primary impact by immediately darkening and deadening the human spirit of Adam and Eve. The sting injected a replicating element that carried with it a host of characteristics, such as lying, anger, jealousy, envy, and lust. We can possess these behaviors without needing schooling in them. We mostly educate and discipline our young contrary to these behaviors, because it is natural for these traits to occur, and in every generation, these same patterns can be seen. No matter how much education and social position we have, these tendencies remain strong, and we cannot educate or breed this active principle out of humanity. Patina of Hardness Although we can demonstrate a similitude of love, happiness, patience, forgiveness, etc., we still have a nature that is contaminated with the fallen element. Our long-term denial, efforts to cover up our true collective experience, become like layers of tarnish on a metal object concealing the underlying beauty, which is buried under a thick coating. We overlay ourselves with everything from invention to philosophy to alleviate the stress of coming short of the eternal plan of God. This onboard freight has caused a rude mockery of what we were designed to be because we were meant to carry God as true vessels of nobility. Universal Anesthesia Often we are satisfied with the mere good side of behavior and its symbiotic presence with the bad causes us to overlook the recurrence of the negative side. 
Notwithstanding this, without the change of cargo, this good behavior is just the other branch of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Natural goodness springs forth from the other branch on the forbidden tree and has the same root system as the evil branch. Natural goodness is a major reason why humanity remains stagnant concerning God's purpose. There is the tendency to count good behavior as a commodity that God values, even though this good is mixed with its fair share of bad. If it were possible solely to express good, this still would not fulfill God's plan, because we were designed to show forth the divine virtues rather than the mixed human virtues. The authentic exhibition of the Creator's character is inseparably linked to God's indwelling presence because we were created to contain God as our indwelling resource rather than natural-born goodness as our source. John 15, 5 I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Without God's indwelling presence, we are incapable of escaping the dilemma of the mixture of good and evil. This turbulent cocktail of two conflicting inclinations has ravaged humanity, and its trail of destruction can be traced in everyone's life. History records infamous cases in which a dual role was played out with the extreme expression of benevolence and treachery in the same individual. Fortunately, this degree of conflict is occasional. Nevertheless, it illustrates the principle at work within each member of humanity. Human-centered religion became the universal anesthesia to cope with this dichotomy because its spiritual anesthetic numbs the guilt acquired along the way and carries a form of godliness that mimics the outward similitude of a life in union with God. See 2 Timothy 3, 5. This facade of godliness defies the very dynamic of the individual experience of switching the cargo and seeks to improve and uplift the natural inheritance of our fallen condition. Throughout history, the anesthetic of organized religion has had the strange companionship of violence and coercion, and many of the darkest pages in human history have unfolded under the banner of religious structure. Much of our globe seethes under the influence of religious pride, orchestrated through governmental power. To escape, we must no longer employ the numbing effect of the temporary anesthesia of religion, but forge our way onward to the tree of life to experience its liberating power.